So we're kicking off a new series today called How Not to Be an Idiot. And can I just tell you right up front, I hate being an idiot. But I do it so often. Uh, and so let's just do a little group confession. You know, can we, can we do that? Uh, am I the only one who has run out of gas in my car? Go ahead, raise those hands. Go ahead and confess. It feels good to confess, doesn't it? Yeah. See, and uh, uh, I'm not going to ask you to agree with this, but I've, I've done it multiple times. I did it so many times that, you know, I had to repent finally. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it has been, I'm happy to say, over 30 years since I've run out of gas. But, you know, a lot of that is because the cars are wired to help us not be idiots now, right? I mean, first of all, they have a gas gauge on there. They tell you when you're going to be an idiot. And, and lights come on, and now, you know, it starts counting down the distance to empty, right? And it starts telling you, okay, you got 50 miles, you got 40 miles, hey, moron, stop at a gas station, you got 20 miles, you know, it's, it, it, it's let you know. And, and that's the other thing, there's gas stations everywhere, there's people who are selling gas. It's like, hey, come on in here, and don't be an idiot, and, and still, we run out of gas. I hate being an idiot. Or, or how about this, how many of you have ever locked your keys in the car or locked yourself out of your house? Yeah, lots of hands go up on that one. Yeah, we just, I hate being an idiot like that. And, and yet, uh, you know, it, it happens. Or how many of you have ever eaten so much you got sick? Yeah, so you don't, you know, and you're sitting there and, and you're hugging the toilet. You got your face in a place your face was never meant to be. <laughs> and and you're, there's no recovery from that. You're just like, oh, why did I do that again? You're moaning and praying and because and, you're an idiot. Hate that. Or, or how about this one? And, and this is the one that people really don't want to confess at all. How many of you ever backed into your closed garage door? You know? So, uh, you know, there's some people who are like, yeah, I can't confess that publicly. <laughs> My man card's on the line. But yes, I have done that. Uh, it's not a good feeling. Uh, but here's, here's probably the worst one. How many of you have ever asked a woman when she was due? And she wasn't pregnant. Yeah. How many have done it multiple times besides me? Yeah, some of us are slow learners. See, I hate being an idiot. But there is a difference between occasional idiocy and a life that is devoted to it. I mean, all of us have the capacity to be momentary morons, but we don't want to be lifelong idiots. Um, here, here's the way I put it. I expect sometimes that I'm going to step in idiocy. I just don't want to live there. I just don't want to live there. And, and see, here's the thing. God doesn't want us to be idiots either. Um, the Bible doesn't use the word idiot, by the way. It uses the word fool or simple to describe what we're talking about in terms of idiots. Uh, but, uh, but it uses those, and, and actually the word fool in, in Scripture is much stronger word than the word idiot. Much more condemning, if you will, or, or accusatory. And so today we are starting a series on how not to be an idiot. We're looking at the book of Proverbs. We're going to learn from the book of Proverbs over the next couple of months. We're going to uh, break this apart and see if we can't learn from God how not to be idiots. So I want us to read just the introduction to Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, uh, just to kind of set the tone for this series. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance in order to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So let's begin by just talking about the purpose of the book of Proverbs. Purpose of Proverbs. Proverbs was written by Solomon to his sons. So it's a, a book from father to sons. And Solomon, uh, as it tells you, is the king of Israel. He is uh, the son of David. You guys might have heard of him. He killed a giant, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. Stories in 1 Kings 3, 
Uh, you can read it and, and see how God blessed him with wisdom because he didn't ask for riches or glory. He just asked for wisdom. And, uh, and so Solomon's this wise man, and he had boys, and he knew that his sons had the capacity to be young and stupid because young and stupid goes together, right? I and mean, we all understand that. We all, yeah, let's just be honest. We expect young and stupid. Old and stupid, that's pathetic. Okay? Let's just be, we'll be blunt. Proverbs is kind of blunt. We're going to be blunt. Uh, and so we, he expected his boys to be young and stupid. So, so Proverbs is instruction on how not to be an idiot from a father to his sons. Because parents, do you want your children to be idiots? <laughs> it's so funny. There's always a few no's. Everybody else is silent. Kind of like, it's too late. Well, if you don't want your kids to be idiots, read Proverbs and, and have them read Proverbs. And if we don't want to be idiots, we need to read Proverbs. And now, if, it, and, and hopefully you're going to read Proverbs. Hopefully you're going to dive into this book and go, hey, I'm going to learn some things from God. I'm going to uh, let this speak into my life because that's one of my goals is that all of us will read the book of Proverbs. Uh, but uh, as you read the book, let me just give you a couple of thoughts. First of all, note the language in the book. Because the language in the book is from a father to his sons. And, and so at first glance, you pick it up, uh, you might think that it's kind of a sexist book. Uh, now, remember, it was written in 900 B.C. So, uh, you know, the, the roles of men and women were extremely different than they are today. But, uh, but primarily, understand, it's written from a father to his sons. And so the language is pretty much, hey, guys, you're going to have to choose a path. And it's represented by two women. And you're going to see two women prominently featured in the book of Proverbs. And one is the woman that represents folly, foolishness, idiocy. And she's represented by the adulteress that is prominent in chapters 2 through 9. And she uh, is inviting the boys, trying to tempt the boys into this path of destruction. And so Solomon paints this very graphic picture of who she is and where her path leads. And, and then the other woman is the woman of wisdom. And she is delightful and beautiful and desirable, and she will lead you to righteousness and peace and hope and life and blessings and prosperity if you will follow her. She's also referenced extensively in chapters 2 through 9. And the contrast is this. He's saying to his boys, which path are you going to choose? Which way is your life going to go, wisdom or folly? Because you cannot walk both paths. It will be one or the other. So that's the first thought. It's written from fathers to sons. Uh, and second thought is that it's principles, not promises. Proverbs is a book of principles, not promises. Uh, I've actually had conversations with some people who are followers of Jesus Christ who didn't like the book of Proverbs. And I didn't understand that. I said, why don't you like this book? It's, it's glorious wisdom of God. And, and basically said, well, it's not true because uh, these promises don't happen. And I said, no, no, wait. Proverbs is not a book of promises. It's a book of principles. Principles are these broad-based statements that if you apply them to life are true. That they're overarching themes. They're not specific promises. And an overarching theme, a principle, would be this. If you work hard, if you save money, and you don't get into debt, you'll do well. Okay? That's a, that's a principle. A promise is, hey, if you'll come over to my house and do this job, I will pay you this money. That's specific. The principles are broad-based. They're themes. So, uh, for instance, the principle, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Okay, that, that one is kind of one of my favorite Proverbs because it speaks to me because I've got all kinds of words and sometimes they can be reckless. And, and here's the reality. Every reckless word doesn't do damage. But if you live a life of reckless words, you're going to do a lot of damage. You're going to hurt a lot of people in the process. Uh, that's a principle. The promise is one like Isaiah 55 where God says uh, that if you speak my word, it will not return to me void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which I intend it. That if you, if you speak for God, then he's going to plant seeds and produce fruit, and there's going to be something that comes from it. Difference between a principle and a promise. Or how about this, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. A lot of you know this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge God, and he will direct your paths. Okay, great principle there. Trust God, listen to what he says, follow him, he will direct your paths, and it's going to be blessing. Okay, that's a principle. A promise is Romans 8, 28. 
For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those called according to his purpose. In other words, God promises to be involved intimately in your life, picking up the broken pieces and the failures and redeeming those and making something beautiful of them if you love him. So difference between principles and promises. And I hope that as you read this, you'll understand these are the principles that God has given us to live by. And if we live by these principles, our lives are going to be blessed. If we ignore these principles, not so much. It's going to be painful. And, and understand that these principles apply to everyone, not just followers of Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and by that I mean you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you ought to be excited to learn these principles. You ought to be excited to dive into the wisdom of God, because you've already said, Jesus is my Lord, and I believe that this book is God's wisdom, <clears throat> and I'm going to follow him. I want to learn from him. I want to do what he says. But if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, understand <clears throat> that God will still bless you if you apply these principles to your life. And some of you might go, why would he do that? Because these are universal principles of wisdom, of how not to be an idiot. So that's the purpose of Proverbs. Let's look at the path to wisdom. Because the path to wisdom is fear God. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. You've heard this before. Listen, listen to the first half of this again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The starting point to a life of wisdom is to fear God. And that's confusing for us. Because we know Jesus said... Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. Second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so, we're like, wait, we're told to love God, but then you said that fearing God is where wisdom begins. How does that fit? Uh, fear of the Lord is the first step on the journey that leads to a loving, intimate relationship with God. Okay, hear this. Fearing God is where it begins. It's not where it ends. It's not where it stays. But it's the first step on a journey that's going to lead you to a relationship with God that is loving, that is intimate, that is a blessing to you. And it's what you were created for. But it begins at this point of fear. Uh, so let me just ask this. How many of you had a father? Yeah, see all the hands should go up. That's just my way of testing who's actually participating. Uh, <laughs> So ask a, a follow-up. How many of you had a dad that disciplined you? Yeah. Lots of hands go up. So how many of you, if your father disciplined you, knew that your dad loved you? See, there, there's not a disconnect there. So we knew that our dads loved us, and yet we're still afraid to disobey because of the consequences of that. Um, see, I love my dad. And... Uh, and yet I always knew that my dad loved me. And, and my dad was, well, in, in any way, I've, I've told my parents lots of times, uh, they were mean parents. Okay? They were mean parents. They were disciplinarians. I've thanked them for that. Uh, I got to express that to them. So uh, I loved my dad. And I always knew my dad loved me, even when uh, there was discipline involved. And, and I'll just be honest. When I was a kid, my dad could be scary. Anybody else have, like, parents that, you know, when you, yeah, your dad, when he, he was disciplining you, it was not pretty. And so I knew that he loved me. I loved him, but I, I feared the consequences of disobedience. I feared getting caught. Uh, and then as I got older, I feared disappointing him. Because I didn't want to hear, man, I'm, Chad, I'm really disappointed in you. I mean, that was worse than, than you know, the, the physical discipline, which <laughs> was quite painful in and of itself. Now, as I grew and as, and as I matured, the relationship changed. It grew and it developed. And, and so the fear became respect and friendship. And the one who had been the discipliner became the counselor. Isn't it interesting that God calls himself our Heavenly Father? Heavenly Father. He says that he disciplines those that he loves as a father disciplines his children out of relationship, out of love. 
So how do we put this fearing God and loving God all together? Well, the path to wisdom begins when we understand who God is. See, God is creator. God is creator of everything that is. That, that's why the opening line in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created. God created what? The heavens and the earth, everything that exists. The universe, the solar system, the galaxies, the galaxies among galaxies, the, whatever the you know, physicists call those, the, you know, they talk about all these you know, stars that are out there that are unlimited. God is greater than all of that. He's greater than all of that, and yet he still knows you and loves you and is involved in your life. God is the creator. God is the judge. God is the king. God is our redeemer. He's the one who sent his one and only son into this world to pay for your sins, to give his life on the cross, to redeem us from hell. We need to understand who God is. He made the world, and therefore he made the rules. He knows how this world works. And God is bigger and smarter than we are. We need to understand who God is. If we're going to fear God, then we need to understand who he is, and we need to respect his power. God created you. He gave you life. Literally breathed life into uh, our ancestors. And, and so he's, he's involved in our creation, gives us life. And, and just be honest with it, because we talked about all the power that he has, God can kill you. I know we don't really like to think about that, but he can. I mean, if you're not sure, then read the Bible. Because there's stories of people who kind of say, you know, up yours to God, and sometimes God strikes them dead. And, and if he did that every time we did it, then all of us would be dead. Because at some point, we've all defied God openly. That's his grace, by the way, the reason that we're still alive. But God, God created us. God can kill us. And guess what? God will judge us. Every one of us will give an account of our lives to the living God. So respect God's power. Hey, we got any electricians in the room? People who work with electricity? Okay, a few hands go up. What happens if you don't respect electricity? Oh, some of you have disrespected it, I hear. Okay. A little bit of murmuring going on. Yeah, it, 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 it can hurt you. It can kill you. Uh, any uh, craftsmen in here? Any people who build stuff and things like that? Lots of hands go up. What happens if you don't respect power tools and saws? <laughs> yeah, people are holding up their hands like, yeah. <laughs> you lose these. You know, they, they go away. Uh, you know, they, yeah, you can, you can damage yourself, you can kill yourself. So if we don't respect the power of God, what happens? If you're not sure, read the book of Proverbs. Because it paints the picture really clearly. It is damage, it is destruction, it is pain in our lives when we don't respect the power of God. And the fear of the Lord is to understand who God is, respect God's power... And it's to embrace God's teaching. Now, I think this is harder than respecting his power because we usually grasp when someone is stronger and more dangerous than us. We kind of have that built in. But we are loath to admit that anyone is smarter than us. And if you're not sure about that, then just answer this question. How easy is it for you to admit that you were wrong? Honestly, how easy is it for you to admit that you were wrong? Because a lot of times we will sacrifice relationships with people that we love in order to be right. A lot of times we'd rather win the argument than win the friendship. And there are people in this room who have broken relationships with their parents because one or the other or both won't simply say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And there are people in this room who have broken relationships with their kids because you wouldn't say, I was wrong, or you wanted to prove that you were right more than you wanted to redeem the relationship. And yet, the fear of the Lord, if we're going to embrace wisdom, then we've got to embrace God's teaching because to fear God is to admit that God is smarter than you and you need his instruction for life. Let me say that again. To to fear God is to admit that God is smarter than you and that you actually need his instruction for life. Uh, 
Just listen again to what Solomon writes. In verse 2, he says, The purpose of this book is to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. His purpose is, I'm trying to give you wisdom. I'm trying to give you instruction. In verse 5, he encourages us. He says, let the wise hear and increase in learning. So you think you know something. He's saying, hey, you ought to pay attention and increase your knowledge. Increase your understanding. And then did you catch the, the last part of verse 7? Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Are, are you teachable? Are you open to God correcting you and instructing you? Because if you say, no, I've, I've figured it out and I know what I'm going to live and I know how I'm going to do my life and I'm not going to listen, then you've already chosen a life of idiocy. That, that's what Solomon is pointing out. Are we willing to say, God, I need you to teach me? The path to wisdom begins when we admit we don't know what we're doing. We ask for God's instruction. And when we ask for God's instruction, it means that we're committed to doing what God tells us. James chapter 1, if you want to read this, uh, he says, let those who lack wisdom ask, and God who gives generously will give to anyone who asks, as long as he asks and doesn't doubt. Because if you doubt, which, which means, hey, I'm not sure I'm going to do this, God. You know, you give me wisdom and maybe I'll do it. He says, then you're just like the trash that's tossed around on the foam of the, of the waves. You're just here and there and wherever and you don't have any direction in life. So we come to God and we say, God, we need you to teach us. And, and in doing that, you're submitting yourself to God. And wisdom is found when we say, God, instruct me and I will do what you say. I will follow where you lead. I will embrace your teachings. But if you ask God for directions and then you evaluate whether God is right, that is just foolish arrogance. And yet how often do we do that? How often do we read in this word or we listen to a sermon uh, or God speaks to us through a friend and we go, yeah, but. And then we excuse our actions. We excuse our choices. And we walk away from wisdom. We walk away from, from the God who wants to lead us to life and instead we embrace folly. So here's the challenge. Will you embrace God's teaching? recognizing that God is wiser than you are. And by that, I'm, I'm gonna ch here's the challenge for the next 31 days. Next 31 days, I want to challenge you to read one chapter of Proverbs each day. Guess how many chapters of Proverbs there are? Right, you guys are brilliant. So you got this. So 31 chapters of Proverbs, 31 days, and, and I want you to read one chapter of Proverbs a day, but not just read it so you can check it off and say, okay, I read Proverbs. I want you to read Proverbs, and I want you to pick one proverb out of that chapter that speaks to you. In other words, God is talking to you, and you go, I really like that. That really makes a difference in my life. God's really convicting me of how I'm living, uh, whatever it is. But you take one verse out of that proverb and say, this is my verse, and then I want you to share it with your life group or your family or your friends or whoever you hang out with and go to you know, lunch after church with, because you, know, you should have seven at the end of the week, seven verses uh, of like, man, these are, this is what God said to me this week. Now, a lot of you are going to do that, and that's really cool, but here's the temptation you're going to face. You're going to read Proverbs, and you're going to think, man, my kids need that verse. My husband needs that verse. Oh, I got some friends. They really need this verse. Okay, all that may be true, but don't do it. Don't give in to it. This is not for them. This is for you to encounter God's wisdom and let God speak to your life. Because those Proverbs that make a difference in your life will stick with you and you'll give God a voice in your life and you'll go, hey, I remember that one. Because <clears throat> for me, reckless words pierce like a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. And God will speak to you and he'll begin to change your life if you'll take the challenge and say, God, I want to hear your wisdom. I want you to teach me. Because you know what most of us want? is we want God to change our lives without changing us. We want God to make all of our life different all around us, all the circumstances different around us, but we don't really want to change. We want everybody else to change. It's not going to happen. If you want God to change your life, then it begins by you saying, God, I'm open to you changing me. Teach me from your word. Speak to my life. Speak to my heart. I will listen. I will follow. I will do what you ask me to do. And that 
is where the beginning of wisdom is. That's what it means to fear God. To respect his power and embrace his wisdom. Um, Let's close by addressing the distinct destinations. Because Proverbs is all about where we're going to end up. Uh, If you've got a Bible like mine, turn the page, one page. I want to look at the the end of chapter 1, beginning at verse 31. Uh, I mean, you should read the whole chapter. Wait, you are, because are, I already challenged you. Read chapter 1 tonight. Uh, he wraps this up by saying, Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have the fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Don't you love that? We will all eat the fruit of our way. You don't get away from that. You can't escape that. The Apostle Paul echoes that in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, when he says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. It's impossible to mock God. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, guess what he's going to reap from the flesh? Destruction. If he sows to the Spirit, guess what he's going to reap from the Spirit? Eternal life. He just paints this really clear picture that we're all going to eat what we sow. We're going to eat the fruit of our way. In other words, you've got the path of wisdom or you've got the path of idiocy, of foolishness, of folly. And then Proverbs talks about where these paths lead. Proverbs eleven eighteen says, The wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. Proverbs 22, 8 says, Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. So what do you want for your life? Do you want calamity or do you want reward? (laughs) So what do you want for your life? Do you want calamity or do you want reward? Okay, well, that's what you say. But see, it's so easy for us to say the right stuff. We're in church. Oh, yeah, we love God. We want to do this. But are we willing to choose reward over calamity? Because it's not about what you say. It's about how you live your life. You determine the life you have by the path you take. You decide whether you're going to walk in wisdom or whether you're going to walk in folly. Now, I'm a sinner, and and I know I make mistakes, uh, and so I know that sometimes I'm going to step in folly. I'm going to step in idiocy. But I've chosen to respect God's power. I've chosen to embrace God's teaching. I'm not going to live an idiot's life. What are you going to do? Because God has left the choice up to each one of us. What path are we going to take? Which way are we going to go? Because we're all going to eat the fruit of our own way. Let's pray.